Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Well, as I said before, my name is Russell I'm an alcoholic. I'm a member of the Carl Gables Group of Alcoholics Anonymous. I haven't found it necessary to have a drink or take a drink since January 25th, 1981. So I've been around here for a while. And it is good to be here. And we are continuing and ending a series I've been doing on the 12 steps. And this is just my own personal experiences, my own personal point of view. You don't have to agree with them. You don't have to do what I do. I'm just been asked to do service for the group, and I'm always available whenever I'm asked to do service. And uh, it's a uh, it's not only a pleasure, but it's a privilege to be asked to chair or give any service to an AA meeting. And and we're going to be talking about stuff like that because today we're going to talk about. You know, I'm going to try to share a little bit about the 12 step. You know, I've uh, I've been around for I guess I don't know 32 and a half years, something like that, and. Um, I'm not the same guy in many respects that walked into my first AA meeting uh, a little over 32 and a half years ago. Uh, there's been some changes. I'm, uh, I'm, I walked in when I was 31. I'm 64 now, and uh, I raised four children. I have six grandchildren, sponsored quite a lot of men, quite a few. You know, I have the, the incredible pleasure of having a fellowship that was grown around me of sponsees and grand sponsees and great grand sponsees. And I've had a fellowship of sponsors and mentors, and uh, and it's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful experience. And I, I want to talk a little bit about service. I'm going to talk a lot about service. And uh, uh, you don't have to specifically, I, I as, you, as you can realize, one of the things I do is I, I get to speak a lot. Uh, you know, different people have gifts in different areas. I, I speak around and I sponsor people. Some people work behind the bar and things like that. But I want to, uh, I want to give you a little take based upon some readings in the big book, Alcoholics Anonymous, and some other books. I'm going to read an excerpt from the Bible that's mentioned in the big book, uh, regarding the connection between service and emotional sobriety. I, 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 if you've been following this series, I, I'm, uh, it's not that I don't care whether you're a drinker or not a drinker or anything like that. It's just that in the, in, in the years that I've been sober, most of the people that I've spoken to in AA, in AA groups, as a matter of fact, almost everybody I've spoken to in AA groups, most people I sponsor do not have drinking problems. The drinking is a symptom of the problem. It's either gone or it's gone away very quickly. Maybe the obsession hangs around for a while, but then that goes. And then, as they say in the big book, the drinking is a symptom. When men and women drink because they like the effect produced by alcohol. That's why we drink, because the, because for me, alcohol just worked better than women, although women worked. It worked better than money, although money works. It worked better than cars and prestige and diplomas, although they work. In other words, what I have to understand, and what I ultimately understand after many years of being in this in this fellowship, is not only did I use drinking because no nothing in my life worked quite as well and quite as fast on alcoholism, which is a disease that centers in my mind and in my body, and its primary primary basis is having a character and a personality that's selfish. It's about being selfish and self-centered and egocentric, which leads to being driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking, where you're constantly in conflict with other people because all you care about is yourself, no matter how much you think you're a good person. And ultimately, you hurt people based upon your decisions, and even though you rationalize, you tell yourself rational lies that you are doing, quote, good orderly direction, the fact of the matter is, is most of the good orderly direction that I do, if not directed by God, somehow I come out the winner. And I don't even see it. I'm, I'm, I'm an example of self-will, 
ego-driven, self-will-run riot, though I usually don't think so. Above everything, I have to get rid of that self selfishness, I must or it kills me. God makes that possible. That's what these steps are all about. It's about completely change your personality uh, into the personality and the character of your creator. That's what it says in the sixth step. It says this thing that separates the men from the boys, once you get rid of the alcohol, is the men, the people we call men in here, are those who are, it's not about the alcohol anymore, it's about growing in the image and likeness of their creator by doing whatever they have to do over the period of a lifetime, a lifetime, operating in such a way so they allow the Holy Spirit, because we realize that God is doing for us what we cannot do for ourselves, work on them so their personality changes. And the one thing I didn't want to change when I came in here was my personality. I was in love with me. You know, when I didn't hate myself. I told my sponsor, I said, well, whenever I'd act up, I'd say, well, that's just my personality. That's just the way I am. He'd say, Russell, it's your personality that's killing you. It's your personality that's driving people away, that's hurting people. And, of course, we learn about, we learn about changing. We learn about that the same way we learn ultimately about alcohol. How did you learn about the alcohol problem? Did you learn about the alcohol problem because you had a bad Saturday night and your wife or your, your, you know, your husband or your, or a boyfriend or a girlfriend or your parents said, you know, we think you're drinking something too much and you say, gee, I figured that out now. You're right. I'll go to Alcoholics Anonymous. Or did you learn the way we always learn in here? Through a hundred forms of humiliation and the final crushing of your self-sufficiency. Did you learn by experiencing running into reality and having a great deal of pain over a period of years hurting a lot of people until you finally got to the point where there are three mile island occurred, the wife left, you got fired, you found out all of a sudden that you had lost all self respect, self esteem, and you were driven to your knees and you find yourself at Alcoholics Anonymous. Is that how you got smart? Because that's how I got smart. I had all sorts of degrees on the wall. I was the smartest guy when I was the smartest guy in the room, I was the mo I was the drunkest, most arrogant guy in the room. And I had to be driven to my knees. And that's after alcohol decimated me. Imagine how much pain for how long a period of time, what you have to do to get to the point when you realize that sex is the same thing as alcohol. I didn't want to give that deal up. Lusting is the same thing. Coveting things are the same thing. That all that other stuff that also worked, I was still working that program. I was working the same program after came to AA as the program I worked before coming to AA. It, it, I just changed. I changed from alcohol to money, alcohol to the job, alcohol to the boss, alcohol to the wife, alcohol to the girlfriend, alcohol to the sex, alcohol to the, the vacation, alcohol to everything out there that is something that I had to acquire in order to make me feel okay. You know? But, you know, just like with the alcohol, I didn't think that was a problem because you know why? Everybody else is doing it. One of the things I learned about the, you know, when you say we rationalize, you know, the, the, the disease centers in our minds, not our body. I don't understand the word. You know, we, we use very soft words in here. That's why it's good to have a sponsor. It's good for me to have a sponsor because, you know, I'm, I'm, e I'm ego driven. Uh, I think the world revolves around me. I'm selfish. I'm self-centered. And I think I'm brilliant. And that being the case, when you're dealing with a personality like that, and you, you, you learn ultimately it's the best thing that gets you in here, it's very easy to twist words to somehow mean that you're okay and they're wrong. You can just somehow, so, so what I had to learn is that what rationalize means, which is a, soft, is a soft way of saying, I tell myself rational lies. That if you're an alcoholic, and it's not just alcoholics, you know, other people do this too. They live lives of quiet desperation. They just don't have meetings to go to. I lie to myself about stuff in order so that I don't have to change, or I don't have to, so I don't have to do this thing, or I can let myself off the hook and tell myself I'm okay. And I got a million different lies I tell myself, and I don't even think they're lies because it's just the way I think. It's just, I've been thinking like this ever since I was in the womb. This is the way I think. It's comfortable. To, I'll get, you know, in here we call rationalized, we call them old ideas. That's what they call them, old ideas. They're not even ideas in a sense. They're sort of patterns of thinking. They're concepts. And 
one of the rational lies, I'd say, and, and they're concepts that are killing me, but I don't, if you think alcohol sneaks up on you subtly over a period of 15 years, you wouldn't believe how these rational lies don't even sneak up on you. They're already embedded in you, like a computer virus. And God forbid, if you think you get mad at people who try to get rid of the alcohol, you wouldn't believe how you avoid the people that try to tell you that your thinking is wrong. I'll give you a one 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 rational lie that I tell myself. I tend to myself tell myself all the time because it's so damn comfortable, and it it's so helpful to me in not changing and remaining selfish. Here's a rational lie: everybody's doing it. Everybody's like that. You know, for years I told myself that the drink. Well, everybody drinks like that. Well, I don't drink any differently than anybody else. Everybody drinks. Only there's like three weird people. They're born again Christians. They don't drink. They're idiots. You know what I mean? <laughs> the whole world drinks the way I drink. Everybody does that. You know? Forget about the drinking. Chasing after the cars. Chasing after women. You know, sex and everything like that. Everybody does that. There's nothing wrong with that. Everybody does that. You know what I mean? Go to the movies. It's true. Look at the billboards. Look at the advertisements. I mean, it's about Viagra. It's a, sex is the most... Did you know that sex... And the ability to have a heart on until you're 90 years old is the most important thing in the world. And you have to judge yourself by how many times you're getting laid every week. Did you know that? Well, everybody knows that. I mean, you just not only hear that in AA or outside and that everybody knows that. The TV will tell you that because they're making billions of dollars telling you that. Everybody knows that. Everybody knows that people that do not have sex are insufficient. And that if you're not having sex, you ought to feel really bad about yourself. Did you know that, you know, uh, if you're, if you don't have big breasts, you're insufficient, you know? Everybody knows that. Does everybody know that? I mean, that's why they have billboards and about people about cosmetic surgery. There's so many things that everybody knows and everybody does. You know, I mean, stuff I do that maybe are, is harmful to me, or hurtful, but you know, everybody does that. You know, what, what I, what I don't tell myself and I forget is that there's a great separation that happens in here. And the people that, that we admire, the people that the world admires, are not the people that do what everybody else does. The people like Jesus, the people like, Al, you know, the people like the, the spiritual people, Mahatma Gandhi, the people that we hold up, the, the people that we hold up are not people that do what everybody does. We hold them up because they're somehow different and special. They're few and far between. People like Billy Graham does not live a lot. I mean, I'm not saying he's perfect or anybody's perfect. I'm just saying we hold up and we, 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 we are awestruck by people that don't do what everybody else does. And in fact, as you know, in the Bible, which is what they're reading for the first four years in AA, it says, do the narrow way. He says, there's the narrow way and the broad highway. The broad highway, which everybody goes on, and then there's the narrow way, which few find it. When I came into AA, I certainly wasn't a religious person, but the first thing I remember my sponsor tell, telling me, he says, you know, Russ, many are called, but few are chosen. And very, very, very few people. I've been around AA for a long time. You know, you may have people that stay sober for a while. Very few people get to 20 years. And even after 20 or 30 years, I can't tell you how many few people experience much of heaven or rocket in the fourth dimension of the existence of which they had not even dreamed. Very few people get the, the permanent promises and the abundant life that's promised by this program. And it's because very few people are willing or ready to sacrifice and do the things and change their ideas the way you have to change your ideas past not drinking. Most people in Alcoholics Anonymous settle. That's what the six step says. They settle for just the not drinking pro. Don't drink and go to meetings. That's what the treatment center sell. You know, you can't put that down. How can you say in a meeting it's bad to not drink? Well, you know something? Not drinking and go to meetings will keep you sober for a few years. You know, it's probably a good thing for a few years. But you know something? If your program is not drink and go to meetings after 10 or 15 years, you're going to find that you're going to be going to more meetings and enjoying it less. You're going to find that there's something missing. Because there's more to this program than just not drinking and going to meetings. And even though the only thing we hand out medallions for in these rooms are not drinking for 5 years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 
You will find as you hang around here that there are people with five years that drink, there are people with three years that drink, there are people with one year that drinks, there are people with 20 years that drink, there are people with 30 years that drink. There are people here that have 30 years and commit suicide. There are people here with 10 years that commit suicide. There are people that have 15, 20 years that are thumb-sucking crybabies, that are whining and talking bad about other people behind their back. There are people here that have all sorts of problems, either sexual problems, Pornography problems, every problem you could possibly imagine, can't hold a marriage together, treat people selfishly, and, you know, they're physically sober, and they'll get a medallion. And they get all sorts of problems, but you know something, they're not drinking, and they're going to meetings. And if that's the sobriety you want, that is available to you in here. You know, you can have the not drinking program, or you can have the experience much of heaven being rocked in the fourth dimension program. I want to read you a couple things from the book, sort of tie this into... Uh, the uh, the concept of the 12th step. And, and, and the question you got to ask yourself at all times, and the question i got to ask myself, is whether you're ready. I mean, are you ready? Are you ready to do this deal? Do you think you'll ever be ready? You know, that's the initial question in the book. If you want what we have, and you're willing to go to any length to get it, then you're ready. If you don't want what we have, and you're not willing to go to any length to get it, then you're not Ready. You're just not ready. Now, you may meet somebody in here, and they and you may want to stop drinking. So you may meet somebody in here who you call to be your sponsor, because he's not drinking, he's your sponsor, and you may want what he's got. You may want to stop drinking, and you may be ready to get that deal. You may want to stop drinking more than anything else. And you know something? If that's the case... You're ready, and you will stop drinking. I'm telling you, you will. You'll stop drinking, and the obsession will even leave. You will do what you have to do. You will do what you're told. You will follow directions, and you will stop drinking. And after you stop drinking, you will find out about thinking. You'll find out about the thinking problem. You'll find out about anxiety. And you'll find out about worry. And maybe at nine months or ten months or two years, It'll dawn on you why the hell you drank in the first place. <laughs> you may try to marry somebody in AA and say, well, this will fix it, and then you find out the whole thing blows up and that doesn't fix it. You may think marriage will fix it, find out that doesn't fix it. You may find out that you can't hold a decent relationship with it and that doesn't fix it. You may think the job will fix it, and you'll find out that isn't going to fix it. You may think money's going to fix it, and you'll find out money doesn't fix it, and you'll be a sorry, sorry person because you'll be running, you'll be doing the program that you were doing before you came into AA, only without the alcohol. You'll be running after stuff and things and people and relationships to fix you while going to a program that tells you only God could and would if you were sought. Then you can't manage your way out of it. No person can get you out of it. No relationship will get you out. Only your relationship with God. And you will be trying to plug that deal and fix that deal by doing the exact same lifestyle you were doing before you came in here, except, in you, except, except instead of going to the bar, this will be your bar. And since this isn't exactly Well People's Anonymous, trust me on that, you will rely on the wisdom of the rooms, of the majority of the people you run into here, who will be happy, just like they did for me in the bar, to pat you on the back and say, don't worry about that. Everybody does it. Don't feel guilty. Don't feel bad. You're doing okay. Just don't drink and go to meetings. Everything's going to be wonderful. Now, you might run into some old coot that says something you want you to grow the hell up. You know what I mean? And get right with this thing and stop screwing around and do this and do that. But you got to avoid that son of a bitch because he's obviously got some sort of an issue, you know? He's got issues, you know? So the real question is, what are you, ready, what are you willing to become? It says here, let me read you a couple things out of the book and then sort of try to tie this in. It says, you remember Roland Hazard? Roland Hazard was a guy who put himself under Dr. Young's uh, uh, tutelage or whatever it is, and he thought knowing the inner workings of his mind. Drinking was impossible. And then they re released him from the sanitarium after one year. He wound up in Paris drunk, and then he... He went back to the doctor, and this is what the doctor said to him. It said, it said, he's, the doctor said, you have the mind of a chronic alcoholic. This is, we have mostly alcoholics in here. I know we have visitors, mostly alcoholics. Well, if you're an alcoholic, then you have the mind of a chronic alcoholic. You're just like this guy. So this isn't, you know, don't get mad at me. I'm just a messenger. I'm just reading our basic text, which we're supposed to agree with. 
says you have the mind of a chronic alcoholic. That's you. You have. Everybody in here has the mind of a chronic alcoholic. He says, I've never seen one case recover where that state of mind existed to the extent that it does in you. Our friend felt as though the gates of hell had closed on him with a clang. He said to the doctor, is there no exception? He said, yeah. Now, I know this guy had been dry for a year, sitting around learning about himself from the greatest psychiatrist in, you know, you talk about treatment centers, one year under the greatest psychiatrist without a drink for a year. And he went out and drank. You know how many people go to multiple numbers of treatment centers and try this over and over again over 10 or 15 years, and they get a year, they get two years, they get five years, and they drink again? Scads and scads of people now call it synonymous. Yes, replied the doctor, but there is. Exceptions to cases such as yours have been occurring since early times. Since early times, people have been relieved of the degree, disease of alcoholism and all sorts of other diseases. This program was not invented by Bill Wilson. He didn't even say he invented it. Since between the, the big book was written in 1939, AA started in 1935. Between 1935 and 1939, there's a book, Dr. Bob and the Good Old Timers. It's right there. It's conference approved. You can read it. All they did was pray and read the Holy Bible. And they said the books we found absolutely essential was Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, 1 Corinthians 13, and the book of James. And we almost called Alcoholics Anonymous the James Gang. So their whole life was based upon the principles of the Holy Bible. And if you are acquainted with the Holy Bible, which most people aren't, but if you are, and if you become acquainted, when you read the big book, you'll say, yeah, this is just the Bible. This is just the principles of the Bible. This is just what's been around for thousands of years. I mean, you're entitled to your own opinions. You're just not entitled to your own facts. And even the book says... The big book, I'm not talking about the fellowship. If you just hang around the fellowship and listen to the people in the fellowship, you'll think religion is bad. I'm spiritual, not religious. Sort of like that that, that high-handed, holier-than-thou sort of deal like, I'm spiritual. I'm like a special person, not like those religious people. You know, I'm just like at a higher level when what you really are is a selfish, self-centered, arrogant, defiant, holier-than-thou alcoholic who has done nothing but hurt people, and you'll probably hurt people again. <laughs> what the big book says, it says we lose prejudice against organized religion. We begin, we lose all prejudice against organized religion. We encourage church membership. We begin to see where religious people are right. Now, that's the big book. That's the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, not the fellowship, which is made out of mostly people who are not willing to do this or give up old ideas and think that basically... What we're about is not drinking and going to meetings. That's why Bill Wilson said it's all about the next frontier, emotional sobriety. People who have emotional sobriety don't talk badly about religion. They, they actually delve into it. They want to see what's good about it. Because Bill Wilson was sponsored, essentially, by clergymen, by Ed Dowling and Sam Schumacher. That's why in the sixth step it says our test is as a well-loved clergyman. Now, you wouldn't know that if you hung around Alcoholics Anonymous because you think religion is like an anathema. Some of the most stable people I know and I followed were very religious in Alcoholics Anonymous. You know why? Because they're not scared of religion. They're not scared of the Bible. Most alcoholics are scared crapless of people who are either into that stuff or whatever. They're just scared or they feel insufficient. So they put on this whole thing like we're sort of better than. Yes, replied the doctor, there is exceptions to cases such as yours that have been occurring since earlier times. Here and there, once in a while, alcoholics have what are called vital spiritual experiences. To me, these occurrences are phenomena. He doesn't understand them. They appear to be in the nature of huge emotional displacements and rearrangements. Ideas, now here we go, ideas, emotions, and attitudes, which were once the guiding forces of the lives of these men. Okay, listen to this. Ideas. That's all your ideas. Emotions, that's all your emotions. And attitudes, that's every emo attitude you have in your, your life right now. Which, by the way, I might point out, makes up your, your thinking. So if you find yourself, after you leave the meeting, now, during the meeting, you probably feel okay. There's a certain after effect of meetings, so when you go out for about a half an hour or, you know, an hour and a half or something like that, you still feel kind of okay. But after about 45 minutes or an hour of leaving a meeting, it starts again, doesn't it? I know it does, you know, because I'm a, I'm a recovered alcoholic. I know it. 
You start thinking again, don't you? You start thinking again even if there's nothing wrong. Nothing, God forbid if something actually happens, but even if nothing happens, you start thinking again anyway, don't you? And you have no control over your thinking, do you? And you start thinking about the blemishes in your life. You start thinking bad crap about yourself and other people. You start thinking about the troubling stuff. You start thinking about your life. You start thinking about you. You just you start thinking about what happened back then, or what happened yesterday, or what happened, to, or what's going to happen tomorrow, or what's going to happen three weeks from now. You start thinking, don't you? And it's all bad crap, and it just builds up and it builds up, and then maybe maybe tomorrow you say, "Man, I need a meeting," so you go to a meeting because you need a meeting. <laughs> Because your program is the Don't Drink and Go to Meeting program. And you go to a meeting, and you go to a meeting, and you take a meeting in just like you took scotch. But they can't arrest you for driving while going to meetings, you know what I mean? So you think your life is manageable. And indeed it is. It's a lot better than being a, a helpless, hapless drunk, but you're just as drunk as when you were drinking. You're just as alcoholic as when you were drinking. Because you certainly haven't been rocking in the fourth dimension of existence, which you would not even dream. This disease is alive and well and permeated throughout your entire body. And the only thing you can say is, well, I picked up another medallion. But every once in a while, you'll run into somebody in Outbox and Amazon, and there's a different deal going on. And maybe you'll want what he has. And you'll be willing to go to any length to get it. But you see, in order to want what he has, you've got to hang around those people like leeches. Because the world is out there to just cream your ass with all sorts of signals that tell you you're insufficient and you should do it differently. And if you think you can live 24-7 out in that world with the crap they're feeding you out there, and somehow your mind will basically focus in on that, this stuff, you are wrong. That's why I go to Bible study. That's why I read the Bible, why I go to church, why I hang around all these people. Because I found out when I first came in, my idea was, which I realize now was true, that if I hang around these people that I want, maybe I'll start thinking about it like them. It'll start rubbing off of me like osmosis. Indeed, that's the way it works in bars. You know, if, the, if this guy's thinking about, it, if you know, you are who you hang out with. That's what you think about. That's what you worry about. That's what you concentrate on. Then, obviously, after about two or three years of hanging around and trying to stay sober on the fellowship, I realized there's stuff you actually have to do all the steps. You have to do stuff. It's not just about hanging around people. you got to do stuff. If you hang around certain people, you'll learn you got to do stuff. And you'll want to do stuff. And you'll be cajoled into doing stuff. But you want something after you do the stuff? I, I ultimately realized it is the person you'll be will depend upon the people you hang out with and the books you read. Because even after you do the steps, what happens is if you're in charge of your own life and you're not hanging around the right people, you will rest on your laurels you will start thinking, okay, I'm sober now. I got five years. I got ten years. I got fifteen years. I've done all the steps. I know about all the means. And you will start managing and deciding your own life. And you will hang out with people that has as much as much time of you or less time than you. And you will slowly go down the tubes because you will make the determination in your life what your life is going to be about and what you should do. And trust me, your determination will never have anything to do with going to more meetings, sacrificing more, or doing more stuff. It'll always sound like the rational lie, everybody's doing it, I'm okay, I'm screwing up in this area, but I shouldn't feel guilty about it because everybody's doing it. And you will fall back into the alcoholic trap, you rest on the laurels, but we're heading for trouble if we do. Only if you hang out even in 15, 20 years with people that are so much farther along the line than you, and you decide you want what they have, will you be able to see your deficiencies and not be scared of them, but say, I want to grow, I want to be better, by hanging around these people. And, and it says, they appear to be in the nature of huge emotional displacements, ideas, emotions, and attitudes, which were once the guiding force of the lives of these men, are suddenly cast to one side. The only argument I have with that is it's not necessarily, sometimes suddenly is 25 years. <laughs> and a completely new set of conceptions and motives begin to dominate them. And that's what I'm going to talk about now. So, I want to know whether you're ready. You want this deal? So, are you ready to become servants? Are you ready to become slaves to this deal? Because when you turn your will and your life over to the care of God, your whole life over to God, he's not interested in how much money you make. He's not interested in whether you're getting laid or you ever get laid. He's not interested in how fat you are, how skinny you are. He's not interested in what your job description is. 
He doesn't give a rip about any of that material stuff. All he cares about is whether you're loving on other people and you're helping other people. That's all he cares about. That's all he wants you to do. That's the only thing he wants you to do. He wants you to sacrifice your life for others. He wants your entire focus to be on other people and helping other people to the detriment of yourself. So I know you're ready to give up drinking. I know you may be even ready to give up lusting a little bit or a couple of other things. Are you, are, are you ready to follow some of these guys, the guys that really wrote this book, where their entire life was devoted to helping people? Are you ready to give up all your pleasures? Are you willing to give up the baseball games and the football games? Are you willing to give up, you know, all the other stuff just to help other people? Are you ready, ready for that? And you don't have to say yes. You can do whatever you want to do. But I, I, I've been to the deal. I know, I know the deal. I know what they're asking me here. I know what they're asking you to forfeit in here. I know what this book is all about. And I don't delude myself as to what this book is asking people to do. It's as much as telling you to join a royal priesthood. As any other priesthood, whether it's a Catholic priest or anything like that, or a minister, it's asking you to do that deal. Are you ready for that? And if you think this sounds a little strange and crazy and nutso, well, you know, maybe it is, so you're not ready. Just like when people say, you ought to stop drinking. You say, this guy's nuts. You ought to stop thinking about the women all the time. You say, this guy's nuts. Now you want to get, you ought to stop thinking about the money. This guy's nuts. You can think, you can do that. Let me read you a couple things out of the book, Alcoholics Anonymous. Real fast, and we'll, uh, first I'm going to start with uh, a story that I read all the time to you guys. And this is the story, he sold himself short. This is written by one of the guys, I think it was in the first hundred or so. It's called, He Sold Himself Short. This is on page 260. This is right out of the book, Alcoholics Anonymous. Because there's nothing I'm saying in here that is hidden. There's nothing hidden in Alcoholics Anonymous. What we do have is we have a wonderful fellowship of diseased people. That's what we have in common. You know, if you're, if you're sick with this disease, we'll allow you into the closed meetings. <laughs> so you can stay sober based upon the wisdom of the fellowship. Or you can stay sober based upon this book. Now, if you know this book and you have a decent sponsor, the fellowship won't taint you that much. But believe me, there's as many people, there are many people in here that are pointed to this book, and there are many, many people in here that will point you away from this book. There are many people in here that will say, don't listen to that guy, he's crazy. There's many people in here that say, don't you worry about that. You don't have to do that. You understand what I'm saying? There's as much sickness in here as there is wellness, maybe more. Okay, here we go. You're going to be the one to make the decision as to who you hang out with. You're going to be the one to make the decision as to who who you listen to. You're going to be the one to make the decision as to what books you're going to read or what you're going to do. You're the one who's going to make the decision as to whether you're ready or what you want out of life. And let me tell you something. This ain't a dress rehearsal. By the time you get to the end of your life, 64 years old like me, 75, 85, you're the one who's going to look back and either regret you're either going to pay the price of discipline or pay the cost of regret and say, why didn't I do that stuff? It's going to be one of those two things. These last 18 years have been the happiest of my life, trite though a statement may, be, may seem. 15 of those years I would not have enjoyed had I continued drinking. Doctors told me before I stopped that I had only three years at the outside to live. This latest part of my life has had a purpose. A purpose. Now you try to listen for what his purpose is. Not in the great things accomplished, but daily living. Courage to face each day as we place the fears and uncertainties of earlier years. Acceptance of things as they are as we place the old impatient chopping at the bit to conquer the world. I have stopped tilting at windmills and instead have tried to accomplish the little daily tasks, unimportant in themselves, but tasks that are an integral part of living fully. They asked Bill Wilson, what do you think of people that don't drink and don't go to meetings? He says, I have no use for him, them. They have no gratitude. Where derision, contempt, and pity were once shown me, I now enjoy the respect of many people. Where once I had casual acquaintances, all of whom were fair-weather friends, I now have a host of friends who accept me for what I am, and over my AA years I've made many real, honest, sincere friendships that I shall always cherish. I'm rated as a modestly successful man. I don't know about you, but I was a bragger when it came to money and things. I'm rated as a modestly successful man. My stock of material goods isn't great. 
How many times have you seen, heard people say and testify about their stories? Says I don't have much, but I have a fortune in friendships, courage, self-assurance, and an honest appraisal of my own abilities. Above all, above all, he's talking about the greatest thing he has. Above all, I have gained the greatest thing accorded to any man. What do you think he says the greatest thing accorded to any man is? The love and understanding of a gracious God who has lifted me from the alcoholic scrap heap to a position of trust where I have been able to reap the rich rewards that come from showing a little love for others and from serving them as I can. They once they asked, uh, New York Times reporter once they asked Mother Teresa, she he followed her around for days, says, I wouldn't do what you do for a million dollars. She said, neither would I. <laughs> because you know something? It's a different world. It's a different view of things. It's a different attitude. People that are into this, who are all in, all in. You know, you ever hear the term, I'm all in? People who are all into this thing, like an Olympic athlete, they're thinking completely different than the people that aren't all in. They're, they're looking at things completely differently. They're focusing on things that are different. They think about things that are different. Let's keep on uh, reading what this says. Our book is meant to be suggestive only. We realize we know only little. God will constantly disclose more to you. Ask him in your morning meditation what you can do each day for the man who is still sick. The answer will come if your own house is in order, but obviously you cannot transmit some you haven't got. See to it that your relationship with him is right, and great events will come to pass for you and countless others. This is the great fact for us. Your thoughts should always be on who can I help? What can I do for other people? Go to, go to uh, working with others. Practical experience shows that nothing will so much ensure immunity from drinking as intensive work with alcoholics. Listen, nothing will ensure immunity from thinking as intensive work with alcoholics. And then it goes and says this later on. It says, you, want, you think I'm fanatical? Well, I guess you're lucky you weren't hanging around with Bill and Bob. They're still trying to figure out what Bill was doing for a living after he came to Alcoholics Anonymous. All he did was this stuff. Never. It says, it says, a kindly act once in a while isn't enough. He's talking about 12 steps. A kindly act after once in a while isn't enough, which means a kindly act once in a while isn't enough. <laughs> you see, I know what you think. Here's another rational lie. Well, I'm a good person. No, you're not. <laughs> you're a liar. You're just That's something you tell yourself to feel good. That's like when you say to yourself, I don't give a shit what other people think about me. You tell yourself that too, and all you do is think about what other people think about you. You know you're a liar, but you know you're lying to yourself. Even as you say, I don't give a crap what they think about me, or what they said about me, you know you're lying to yourself, but you say it anyway because it makes you feel better. You're like talking yourself into believing it. So you say things like, I'm a good person, because, you know, the guy in the street, he said he's homeless, you gave him a dollar, maybe you gave him five dollars, you gave the church, you, gave, you, you, know, you go to meetings, you try to help people, so you say you're a good person, but you know that 80% of the time all you do is think about yourself. You know you only care about yourself. You know the number one thing you think about is you. But you tell yourself you're a good person. Because if you tell yourself you're a good person, then you don't have to change and you don't have to do crap because you're a good person. But no, you're not a good person. You're an alcoholic. You're selfish. Though usually you don't think so. It says a kindly act. So here, here, here's, here's a little test. A kindly act once in a while isn't enough. You have to act a good Samaritan every day. I've got the Bible open. We're going to read the good Samaritan. You know why they used the term good Samaritan? With good Arab, it's not really an Arab. It's sort of, it's a whole, I'm not going to go into what a Samaritan is, but it's sort of like that. But you know why they used the term Good Samaritan? Because they were reading the Holy Bible. And Good Samaritan is a story out of the Holy Bible, but nobody really knows that because nobody actually read, goes deeper and reads into what the Good Samaritan is. So even though with the big book, our basic text says, you have to be the Good Samaritan every day, nobody knows what the Good Samaritan is. So they don't even know, they don't need to dig deeper, because why dig deeper? From being the good Samaritan, because after all, you're a good person. So if what if I see something there that I don't like? What if you read the good Samaritan and you say, oh, man, I don't want to do that stuff? Then you would have to change. So it's much better to lie to yourself and say you're a good person. You do kindly acts every once in a while. You know, you made the coffee that night. And you can you can make believe that you're doing Alcoholics Anonymous when you're doing is not, all you're doing is the not drinking on the meeting program. You have to act the good Samaritan every day if need be. It may mean the loss of many nights sleep. Maybe, you know, I was, you know, listen, I'm not holding myself up because I'm as selfish as the next guy. Because my sponsor told me to do it. I would have never done this by myself. He told me to be on relay. I was on relay for eight years. 
every Friday night from 11 o'clock at night till 8 o'clock in the morning. If you any drunk called up in Dade County, Alcoholics Anonymous, I fielded the call. I'm not saying look at me or anything like that. I'm just saying this is what my sponsor told me to do. This is what I did. It's not look how great I am. I'm just telling you, this is what, this is what, a, to me, if you're an AA, this is the kind of stuff you get involved in. I didn't think it was any special. I didn't go to round rooms saying this is what I'm involved in, but you know, I've been asked, this is what I did. My idea of AA is at two o'clock in the morning, you get a phone call because you're on relay. You take the phone call. You try to, you talk to the guy for three hours. You help. That's my concept of what AA is all. That was Bill Wilson's concept. That's the concept of my sponsor and their sponsors and all the men I hang around with in AA. You sponsor, not, I've, I've heard people say, well, how many people, I, I sponsor one or two, I can't sponsor more than that. What do you mean? My sponsor said you sponsor anybody who asked you to sponsor them. You know, <laughs> you, 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 anybody asked you to do anything in the age, say yes. You know, I mean, there are times you could say no, legitimate times, but I didn't know what was, he knew I was selfish, and all I'm going to do is trying to think about ways of getting out of stuff. Yesterday I drove up and did a meeting, we drove 80 miles to a meeting with Garrett. Where did we drive up? Where the hell were we? I don't even know. Boynton Beach. Beach. And some kid at the dinner afterwards, he says, you drove 80 miles? He says, man, I wouldn't do that. I said, well, that's probably true. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go to a meeting 80 miles away, and some guy will say, will you be my sponsor? I'd like to hang around with you. I say, sure. You know, we have a meeting down in Miami. Why don't you come there Saturday? He says, it's a long drive. I say, yeah, you know, it is. <laughs> it is a long drive. <laughs> It is a long drive. Well, you got to want what we have, and you got to be willing to go to any length to get it. And 80 miles is just too long for some people. Driving a long way to means is just too long for some people. Staying up at night is just too much for some people. They just don't want to drink and go to meetings because all they give a shit about is themselves. All they care about is themselves and their own sobriety. They figure as long as they're sober, they shouldn't have to do any extra credit. I get that. But the bottom line is what they don't realize is you miss out on everything else. You don't get all the other benefits that come from being an Alcoholics Anonymous because you're selfish. And all you care about is yourself. So you get selfish sobriety. You get sobriety where you're hanging in, where at 14 years you're hanging in there. And you don't know why you're hanging in there and worried about this and worried about that because all you do is worried about yourself and your own life because you don't give a crap about anybody else because you're really not sober. You just can pass the breathalyzer test. You have to act a good Samaritan every day if need be. It may mean the loss of many nights sleep. Great interference with your pleasures. Interruptions of your business. It may mean sharing your money in your home, counseling frantic wives and relatives. Innumerable trips to police courts, sanitarium, hospitals, jails, and asylums. Your telephone may jangle at any time of the day or night. Your wife may sometimes say she is neglected. Eh, that's my wife all the time. Okay, a truck, a drunk, well, it's true. My wife, when I was doing all this stuff and going to meetings, you know what they say? She says, you go in there again, you, do, you may have to, you may have to get in conflict with your family. You may be, you know how many men I've sponsored who drink again over and over again who can't get this thing because they don't know how to stand up to their wives and say, I'm going to the meeting, I'm helping this guy out. Now there are times, absolutely, you gotta say, no, I'm gonna be here with my wife. You know how many guys put their wives above their sobriety? Put their girlfriends or their jobs above their sobriety? You can't even imagine. And you know what's the first one to complain when the guy drinks? The wife. <laughs> Who said, I can't believe you're going to another meeting. Your wife may sometimes say she is neglected. A drunk may smash the furniture in your home or burn a mattress. You may have to fight to, with him if he is violent. Sometimes you will have to call a doctor and administer sedatives under these directions. Another time you will have to send for the police or order an ambulance. Occasionally you will have to meet all such conditions. This is all in the big book of alcohol science. This is the stuff they were doing. Ain't nobody doing this in Alcoholics Anonymous. Like one half of one percent of the people are doing this in Alcoholics Anonymous. And the rest are saying, well, Russell's just a fanatic. He's an idiot. It's just stupid stuff. You can't do this. I can't devote my life. I got a, I got a life. Russell doesn't have a life. Yeah. Hey, man, I'll stack my life, my kids, my relationships, my deal against anybody in this room. Because you know something? I have an incredible life now. And an unbelievable attitude. And you know why? Because I focus, I'm just my focus, my primary focus is on him and doing the stuff I can do to help other people. And that's the deal. And you want to sum the fact that most people think it's stupid tells me I'm absolutely on the right track. I'd be scared crapless to be what most people in here think is the smart thing to do because I don't want any part of what's going on with most people in here. I've had what most people in here have and I don't want it. I don't need that deal.
You know, but the bottom line is, you know, majority rules, right? What does it say right here? It says, right, right here on an in, into action. At the moment, we are trying to put our lives in order, but this is not an end in its ourself. Our real purpose is to fit ourselves to be of maximum service to God and to, uh, and to the people about us. This is alcohol. This is our program of recovery. When we sincerely took such a position, all sorts of remarkable things follows. We had a new employer. Being all-powerful, he provided everything we needed if we kept close to him and performed his work well. His work. What do you think his work is? To help other people. Established on that footing, we became less and less interested in ourselves, our little plans and designs. More and more, we became interested in seeing what we could contribute to life. As we felt new power flow in, as we enjoyed peace of mind, as we discovered we could face life successfully, as we became conscious of his presence, we began to lose fear of today, tomorrow, and the hereafter we were reborn. What's the predecessor of being reborn? What's the predecessor and the precondition of losing fear of today, tomorrow, and the hereafter? What's the precondition of having power flow in? The precondition of that is you're more and more interested in what you can contribute to life, help other people, and you perform his work well. And stop thinking about yourself. And the people that don't do this, what they don't realize is even at 14, 15, 16, 20 years, they will always be focusing on themselves and their little problem. They will always be worried. They will always suffer from high anxiety. They will always be thumb-sucking crybabies with a, with a veneer of physical sobriety. Always waiting for the, other, for the next shoe to drop, for the cancer to happen, for somebody to die, for the business to go bad. Always focusing on that deal, but never really gaining the sobriety they're talking about in this book. So a few thousand years ago, that Good Samaritan thing, I want to read that because the parable of the Good Samaritan, it's in Luke chapter 10. On one occasion, an expert in the law, a lawyer, that's what I do. You know, a, he says teacher because it, Jesus was a rabbi. What must you do, I do to inherit eternal life? Eternal life, abundant life was like an important thing to them back then. What is written in the law, he replied. How do I read it? How do you read And And when Jesus says, he says, well, how do you read it? You're a lawyer. What do you think? And this is what he said, because this was the law. This is our law in here, by the way. This is our law in here. This is AA law. What I'm about to read is AA law. It's written in the book. And this is what he says. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your mind, your, your, your soul. That's in the A book. The last line they say, see to what your relationship with him is right and great events will come to pass for you and countless others. This is written in AA. And with all your strength and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. This is AA. I just read it. This is all AA. This is all what AA is about. Is that that's the deal? And this is what Jesus says. He says you answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But the lawyer wasn't satisfied with that. The lawyer, but he wanted to justify himself. He wanted to look big to his friends. So he says, "Well, who's my neighbor?" He says, "Well, who's my neighbor? Who should I do this for?" And this is what he says. I mean, this, this program's been around for a long time. Trust me. Bill Wilson didn't just come up with this. In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. When he fell into the hands of robbers, they stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest, a priest, happened to be going down the same road, and when they saw the man, when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. You know, that happens in AA. Guys with long-term sobriety, they pass by on the other side. You know, they don't go out and help other people. They don't sponsor people. There's a lot of guys with sobriety. There's a lot of guys around here that don't sponsor anybody. So too, a Levite, which is supposed to be high up on the ladder. They're the ones that really kept the law and everything. A Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, and this is the interesting thing, is a Samaritan would have been akin to like the lowest level. Somebody who's not like part of the chosen people, not part of, not a holy person. You know, a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He felt sorry for him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. You know the thing I just read from Bill Wilson? The next day, he took out the two silver coins gave them to the innkeeper and said, look after him. And when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. You may have to share your money. You may, you may have great interruptions of your business. 
Which of these do you think was the neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law, the lawyer said, the one who had mercy on him. And then Jesus said, then you go and do likewise. You go and do likewise. You know what this book says? It says you got to be the Good Samaritan every day. If need be. you got to be the Good Samaritan every day. I hung around with guys because I wanted what they had. Believe me, I didn't volunteer for this. I didn't walk in A and say, use me. Let me become a slave. Let me become a servant. I want to, every waking hour, I want to be going to meetings. I want to be helping the people. I want to be, I didn't do that. I just hung around with guys that I wanted what they had. And they gave me these little suggestions. You ought to be the secretary of the group. You know, you ought to get on relay. Why don't you sponsor that guy? You understand what I'm saying? The next thing you know, I'm like, I'm meshed in this stuff. All I'm doing is this stuff. I'm like a fanatic. You know what happens? The the change in attitude in here always follows the action. It's never like, well, when I feel like doing it, I'll do it. When I, I'll think about it, and then I'll do it. It's always you're forced somehow by circumstances to do it, and then the change of attitude happens. And the only way in here, after you stop drinking, that you're forced to do any of this crap is if you link yourself up with a sponsor or somebody that you want what they have, and basically because of that relationship, you do it. You know, nobody came in here because they wanted to come in here. They came in here because you were forced to come in here. I mean, people are jumping out of buildings, and you're saying, well, what's the problem? You know what I mean? We have to be forced to do these things, but the people who want this stuff and are ready to get this stuff somehow end up doing it. And the people that don't want this stuff, they just, you know, they just rest on their laurels and do the other program and they don't get it. It's as simple as, it's as simple as that. I can't make it any simpler. Thank you very much. God bless you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.